Okay, so this is where we left off, right? We left off on trying to explain this blue line. Okay, remember, there's this blue line right in the middle of the oligotrophic ocean. What's oligotrophic mean again? Lacking nutrients. Good, okay. So considering this part is blue, what can you tell about that part compared to the rest of the ocean? What was it? Higher, slightly higher, right? Do you see that most of the ocean is actually purple, which is the worst one? But that one is blue. It's not like amazing or anything, but it's higher than purple, right? So just that straight line right there, that area is slightly higher than the rest. Higher primary production because this is a chlorophyll concentration, right? Chlorophyll means that there's plants there, and if there's plants there, then primary production is occurring. Okay, so we're gonna try to explain that, but to try to explain this, we're gonna have to learn a little bit about ocean currents. So for that, we're gonna have to introduce this really obscure topic that is taught incorrectly, literally everywhere. Okay, so it's called the Coriolis effect. All right, maybe you've heard of it before. Maybe you kind of know what, what it does, but nobody who I've met could explain this well, but I think I got this down, okay? So make sure you guys listen closely. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not critical for you to know how it works, for this class at least, but it's good to know, right? Some cool information. It is important to know what are the effects on the ocean, though, okay? So that part we'll get into. But first, I want to show you guys this clip of someone driving, right? This is really important, right? You guys all do this, but you hardly realize this. Um, look, for, look, look, look at the cars that passes it, right? See that car that passed it, right? This car passed this car, and it looks like it's zooming forward, okay? So when you see something look like it's zooming forward, what can you conclude about it? It's going faster than you, okay? So something that's going faster than you is gonna look like it zooms forward, right? Let's check that one out again. Do you see how it zooms forward? All right, it looks like it's zooming forward because it's faster than you, all right? Continuing on, we're gonna see this car pass this car. You see that? Look, watch it pass it. There, just passed it. Was that car driving backwards? It sure looked like it. Didn't it look like it was going backwards? Just from your perspective, right? It was going backwards. Look at this. From the perspective of this camera angle, this car is stationary and everything it passes is going backwards. You guys see that? But is it actually going backwards? What is it actually doing? It's not slowing down. It's just going slower. Can you replay it? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's a freeway, so I don't think they're slowing down. Like, okay. Looked like it was going backwards. But in fact, it wasn't, right? What was it doing? It was just going slower than you, right? See, like, when you pass stationary objects, they look like they're going backwards, but are they? No, you're just going faster than they are, all right? So they're all going the same direction, but at different speeds. So since they're going at different speeds, some look like they're going forward and some look like they're going backwards. That is the most important concept to understand when you want to understand the Coriolis effect. All right. So let's talk about the Coriolis effect real quick. The similar thing happens on the Earth. All right. Let me just draw a picture of the Earth real quick. Okay. So imagine if this is the Earth and we have the equator right here in the middle. Okay. And then we have somewhere over here near the poles. Okay. All right. Well. In one day, someone standing right here and someone standing right here, they both go around the Earth in 24 hours, right? Because, you know, Earth makes one rotation in 24 hours. Okay, which one of these guys is traveling faster? This one. Why is it this one? He's moving more distance. Yeah, he's covering greater amount of distance in the same amount of time. See, look, this guy travels around this whole ring, whereas this one goes there. So people who live near the tropics are actually moving faster than you guys are, right? And we're moving faster than people in Alaska, okay? Just because we cover longer distances in the same amount of time span, right? Okay, so that's really interesting, right? Um, we're all on the same earth, but some are moving faster, okay? This is not just about people, this is about everything on Earth. So the water here, the wind here, is also moving faster here than it is here. Okay, everything, not just you, every object, the water and the wind as well, are moving faster here than
than there, okay? They're also moving the same direction, right? Earth spins this way, counterclockwise, all right? So Earth spins this way, they're all moving this way, except the things moving here are going faster than the things going here. Are we okay with that so far? The things going here are faster than here, and things going here are faster than here as well, okay? So closer to the poles is slightly slower, and closer to the equator is faster. All right, so the faster things right here, slower things right here. Now let's imagine this car scenario, right? If you're a fast car, right, and you go to a slow lane, everybody else is there is slower, right? When they see you coming in, what are they gonna see? When all the slow cars see you coming into their lane, and you're fast, what are they gonna see? What does it look like you're gonna do? It looks like you're driving backwards. Well, hold on. All the slow cars are looking at the fast car right now. Getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Right, so you got all these slow cars, right? The fast car comes right by you. You know what, I'll just replay the video of what happens when a fast car comes by you. All right, what happens? It just looks like it's zooming forward. All right, when you're fast and you go into a slow lane, all the slow guys over there are going to see something push forward, okay? So imagine something here that is moving fast, moving north. If it moves north, it's going somewhere slower. You guys see that? So what are these things going to think this guy is doing? Just zooming forward real fast, okay? Forward being this direction. So all of these guys are gonna see this one coming in super fast, and it looks like it's just zooming forward, like that. Look at that, we got a deflection. We've got a deflection from its original path towards the right. You guys see that? That's the Coriolis effect happening. Nothing is changing. Its speed is still the same. It's just moving to a slower area. So these guys here can experience this fast guy zooming ahead of them. So let's look at the opposite scenario. Let's take someone slow from here and move him to the fast lane. So imagine someone slow here moving southward to the fast part, right? Let's say you're in the fast lane and someone slow moves into your lane. What are they gonna look like they're doing? Cutting off it. What are they gonna look like they're doing? When you got the slow car coming into the fast lane. Driving backwards. They're gonna look like they're driving backwards. You guys see that? Right? I showed it, I proved it to you guys right here. Look, when this fast car encounters a slower car right over here, it looks like the slow one's going backwards. See that? Just went backwards. Okay. So when this slow guy comes into the fast lane, all from the perspective of all the fast guys. The slow one, who's still going in the same direction, will appear as if it is moving backwards. Backwards being this way. Because this way is forward, right? Because this is the direction of the rotation, right? But then when the slow guys come in here, they'll look like they're going backwards. Okay? So look at that. That's another deflection of its original path, right? Which way? towards its right. So I know this is complicated a little bit, but the right side of this arrow is actually this way. You guys see that? Because you gotta delete its perspective, right? That way. See, this is the right side, okay? Things in the northern hemisphere appear to be deflected towards the right if they are traveling vertically, all right? Because when you travel vertically, you encounter different speed zones. When you encounter different speed zones, then you're gonna see someone who's moving slower or someone who's moving faster do different things. Someone who's moving faster is gonna look like they're zooming forward, and someone who's moving slower is gonna look like they're moving backward. All right, so let's do the same thing, but on the southern hemisphere now, okay? So let's imagine for the southern hemisphere, here's the slow part and here's the fast part right here. If the fast thing moves to the slow area, the slow guys are going to see this fast guy going where? 
moving forward super fast, right? Slow things look at a fast thing and look like, whoa, it just went forward. So forward is this way. Look at that. What direction is that? That's the arrow's left. You see that? Let's try that again. Take something slow, move it somewhere fast over here. What are the fast things going to see when the slow guy comes in? It looks like it's moving backwards. Like the slow guy just merging into the fast lane and immediately he looks like he's moving backwards. Backwards is this way, right? What is that? A deflection towards the left. So the trend here, right? The Coriolis effect causes things moving vertically in the northern hemisphere to be deflected towards the right. All right? It causes things moving vertically in the southern hemisphere to be deflected towards its left. Do we see that now? All right. Keep in mind that it's not actually going left or right. It just looks like it is because everything else is either faster than it or slower than it. All right. So remember, when a slow thing comes into a fast area, the slow thing looks like it's going backwards. And a fast thing going into the slow area, the fast thing looks like it's zooming. Keep in mind that forward is this direction and backward is this direction. Right? Forward and backward because Earth spins counterclockwise. Right? That is the normal direction. Okay, so if you just understand that forward and backwards is this direction, the equator is faster than the poles, and you know what happens when you merge into a lane of different speed, then you'll be able to understand the coils. Right? But the really important part is to know that if you're in the northern hemisphere, then things go towards its right, and if you're in the southern hemisphere, things go towards its left. Okay. All right. So what does this have to do? Like I said, it's not just people, right? It's anything in on the Earth is experiencing these forces as long as they're traveling a far enough distance, right? So. Look at the distance that I made them travel. I made them travel about a fourth of the way across the Earth, right? So to experience the Coriolis effect, you really need to be going quite far, right? You can't be going, you know, just a small distance, right? Just by going one mile, you probably are not going to experience the Coriolis effect. And I hate it when people use a stupid toilet bowl example because the water is traveling this far. like. When the water travels from this side of the toilet to this side of the toilet, or this side of the sink to this side of the sink, is it crossing into a different latitude? You know, like it has to cross into a different latitude that has a slower or faster speed, right? Okay, so like if I were to draw a toilet bowl on here, it's probably right there. Looks like the top and bottom of it are the same latitude, so you'd have to have like a toilet bowl that's this big because it has to traverse latitudes and actually move to a slower area than it started, right? Okay, it only works when you're going from a slow to a fast area due to the Earth's rotation, and it requires that, right? If you want to do some small scale examples, then you can create your own spinning thing, and that one will allow be able to be small scale. But if you want to use Earth as your model, then you have to go that far, right? Okay, so we're not going to see the close effect in your sink or anything. Is that an example of physics? Yeah, sort of. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, the effects, right? It affects things that are moving really far across the Earth. So what are things that are moving really far? Well, airplanes, right? Airplanes move really far across the Earth and they experience this. They have to adjust their flight path to match the coils effect. And um, wind, right? Wind, stuff like that. Right, that one's really important because the wind actually affects the ocean. So let's look at how is the wind affected by Coriolis effect. Here's a map of the surface wind patterns across the Earth. Let's see if they all align with our notion of the Coriolis effect. Look at all the ones up here. Are they going the right way? Check. What do you guys think? Which way should they be going? They should be going towards the towards the right. Are they all going towards the right? Well, let's look at some of these. Are these ones going to the right at least? Yeah. Are these ones going towards the right? Oh, think again. Look at this. They're going down. Which direction is right from down? 
that way. Okay? Don't worry about your right. We're worried about its right. Okay? These are going right. Okay, so the northern hemisphere checks out, right? All right, so now that we know better, can we check the southern hemisphere? Are they all going the right way? Yeah. Which way should they be going? Yeah. Left, right? Are these going left? Yeah. yeah, those are obvious. Are these ones going left? Yeah. Yes, because when you go down, this way is left. Right, just turn your head around and you'll see that that way is left, right? Okay, so the surface wind patterns are affected by the coils effect. Does it make sense that they are? Look, look how far they're traveling. So yeah, they are definitely traversing <laughs> latitudes these ones here are going from a slow area to a fast area, right? So you can see, right? These ones definitely are going to be affected by the coils effect, all right? The ones, these are going up and down, going far enough, and they're going the right way, left and the coils are right. Okay, why is this important? Because wind pushes the water, right? Well, when wind pushes the water, let's focus on this area, right? Do you see this? Right around the equator, there's this little convergence. Can I see this? They're all pushing this way. There's a net direction towards the west. You guys see that? The net direction towards the west. In fact, you get special wind that occurs right at the equator. Right? It's called the trade winds, right? Sorry. Trade winds. Okay. The trade winds over here, also known as easterlies, blows right along the tropics between 30 south and 30 north, and they go towards the west. Why are they called the easterlies then? They, they come from the east, okay? So don't get confused. Whenever you see earlies here, that direction is not the direction that they're going, okay? That's where they're coming from. So if I had something called the northerly winds, which direction are they going? South, because they come from the north. Right. Okay, are you okay with that? Okay, so because of this convergence in the wind patterns, we get a net direction of wind moving this way, right next to the equator, and we call those the trade winds, aka easterlies, right? Like I said, wind pushes the water, so the water starts to move. Okay, the water starts to move right there. Sound okay? The water in these oceans, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, are starting to move in the same direction as the wind because it's being pushed. Okay, what happens when they hit the continent? When they hit the continent, they get deflected and all of a sudden, they are now moving vertically. What happens when they move vertically? They encounter zones of different velocity, right? Because, look, if you're here and you're moving here, are you encountering somewhere that's different speed? From here to here, are we? No, it's at the same latitude, right? Remember, fast, slow, slow. Okay, so if you go from here fast to fast, I, I think it's the same speed, right? It doesn't change. The coils effect does not matter when it's going sideways. Okay, but as soon as it hits the continent, the continent is going to force them to go this way or this way. So if the continent forces it to go this way, now is it encountering different speed? Yes. This one, for example, is going from where? From fast to slow. Remember, fast near the equator, slow towards here. Right? These ones are also going from fast to slow. Okay? So they are encountering different speed areas, speed zones, and the Coriolis effect takes over. When the Coriolis effect takes over, what direction is it going to cause these masses of water to go? For example, this one. This one's going up. Coriolis effect is going to take over and cause it to do what? Veer out this way towards the right. When these ones are going down south, Coriolis effect is gonna take over and cause them to go towards the left, which is actually this way, right? Left. Okay, are we okay with that? So because of that, it causes these water masses to start spinning in those directions, okay? So it all started with the trade winds blowing the water towards the west, but then eventually the continents push it up and down, Coriolis effect takes over and causes them to spin and then spin like this. See, they actually legit spin, and they go in a circle around the whole ocean. That's called a gyre, all right? And there are five of these, 
They're right here, right? The names of these gyres are really easy, okay? You literally just have to know what ocean it's in and whether it's in the northern or southern hemisphere. Super easy, right? Okay, so there's five gyres. Let's look at them real quick. This is the United States. So right over here on our west coast, we have the Pacific Ocean. So look at this. This is the North Pacific Gyre. It's in the Northern Hemisphere. It's in the Pacific Ocean. North Pacific Gyre. Make sense, right? So in consequence, this one is also in the Pacific Ocean. It's called South Pacific Gyre, right? I color coded it for you guys so you guys can see. But North Atlantic, South Atlantic Gyre. And the Indian Ocean is, exists solely in the Southern Hemisphere, so there's only one Indian Ocean over there. Okay? So we get these five ocean gyres caused initially by those trade winds, right? So recap, trade winds are blowing this way along the equator, blows the water, the water gets deflected down or up, and as soon as the water is going vertically, the Coriolis effect takes over and makes them go towards the right and towards the left. And then now it's spinning. Okay, now it's spinning around and around. Okay, the fact that it's spinning around and around creates certain currents that we have names for, right? So here's a map that's a lot more complicated, has the five jars in it, but also all the crazy currents that you find. Okay, we don't have to know all of these, right? But I'm gonna tell you about four of them that I am gonna ask you guys to know. Okay, the four that are associated with the United States, right? At least we should know the ones in our neighborhood. Uh, we don't have to worry about all these crazy currents like the Brazilian current or anything. Let's just learn the ones over here in the North Atlantic Gyre and the North Pacific Gyre, right? But we'll learn those ones. It's not too complicated, right? Okay, so starting on our East Coast here, this is the, which gyre is this? North Atlantic Gyre, right? North Atlantic Gyre, the current on its left side, sorry, its western boundary, right? The western boundary of this gyre is called the Gulf Stream, right? Gulf because Gulf of Mexico, right? So the Gulf Stream is a current moving water from here to here along the western border of the North Atlantic Gyre, all right? And on the eastern boundary, we have the Canary Current coming right by the Canary Islands, which are right over here. Okay, Canary Current going down that way. Okay, so those are the first two of four currents that we're gonna have to know. The Gulf Stream going up our east coast and the Canary Current coming down the coast of Europe. <clears throat> okay, so back to the other side. This is where we are at. Let's look at our neighboring current. Going downward from the top, we have the California current. That one's easy, right? California current brings water from here down to here along the eastern boundary of the, which gyre is this? The North Pacific gyre, right? So easy because it's in the Pacific Ocean, it's in the Northern Hemisphere, North Pacific gyre. Right? On the eastern boundary of that gyre, we have the California current on the western boundary, Passing by Japan, down the Kuroshio current, right? The Kuroshio current. Okay? So, not too complicated, I think. Just those four currents, right? Those are the only ones that I'm really going to ask you guys to know. The rest of them are not going to be super important. But yeah, we should, just, we should know those. Especially this one. I mean, this is the current right in our backyard, right? The California current coming down south on the eastern boundary of the North Pacific Gyre. <clears throat> So by now you figured out that these currents are named for their geography, right? I mean, like look at this, Gulf Stream for Gulf of Mexico, Canary Current for Canary Islands, California for California, and Kuroshio for Japan, right? So we have these currents named for their geography. Maybe you guys can figure out the name of this current right over here. You guys have an idea? What side of Australia is it on? It's on the right side, but how about east. it's on the east side? Yeah. The equation. <laughs> so, put those words together. East it's the East Australian current. Where have we found, figured that? Or where have you heard that one before? Right. Exactly. The East Australian current actually exists, and it goes there. Right. 
let's look at Pixar's rendition of the East Australian Car Wash, shall we? Alright, let's take a look at this. Okay, now do you think it's actually like that? Yeah. I don't know, maybe. It should be, right? You know, to be honest, if you were stuck in that, that would be pretty scary because we don't breathe water, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may not be a good thing if we were stuck inside that. All right, let's look at this article. The largest ocean current close to the shores of Australia, EAC, reaches a maximum velocity 30 degrees south where a flow can reach 90 centimeters per second. How fast is that? 90 centimeters per second? So like 90 centimeters is like almost a meter. In one second, you lose one meter. Well, guess what? When you do, when the fastest people do the 100 meter dash, it is like 10 meters a second. So that's like a thousand centimeters a second. Okay. So what is this? That's like walking speed, right? Hey, it's not that fast. Okay. So the actual currents, the fastest it ever gets is from walking. Nothing to be frightened about, right? Nothing, nothing like what you saw in that video, at least. Okay? All right, but anyways, let's get back to the actual currents, right? Let's talk about why these currents are important because, and, and how they affect the organisms, right? So for example, right over here, let's look at this case study. Why is it so hot and muggy on the East Coast? Have you guys been there before? Is it humid there? Is it humid here? No, okay. Why is it humid there but not here? Keep in mind that places over here, like in North Carolina, are at the same latitude as California. We're at the same latitude. We get the same amount of sunlight. Why are they humid but we're not, right? We should be the same climate if we're at the same latitude, right? But something's different over there than here, right? Let's look at the ocean. What gyre is over here? The North Atlantic gyre. The North Atlantic gyre is over here with two currents. What are the currents? Do we know them now? The Gulf. The Gulf Stream and the Canary Current. Which one do you think affects this one? Well, obviously, the Gulf Stream, because that one's the one right next to it. Okay, so the Gulf Stream is right up along the East Coast from here to here. This is the part where you have to realize that currents carry water. Currents carry water from a certain place. That certain place might have a certain type of water. So let's look at that certain type of water. The water over here, what can you tell me about the water over here? It's cold. Look at it. It's like in, this is like England, Norway, right? I mean, they got some cold, cold, frigid water, right? What about the water here? Look at that. That's Cuba, right? That's the Caribbean. That's tropics, right? Okay. So we got warm water here. We got cold water here currents carry water. So if it's warm here, the Gulf Stream goes up here, what do you think it is doing? It is carrying the warm water towards the north of the coast. Isn't it interesting? You guys see that? Right? Look, the water here is actually not cold. It's warm because it's coming from the tropics because of the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream carries some of that warm water up, up the coast before it becomes cold up here. All right, so as a consequence, if you go swimming around here, the water is actually warm, surprisingly enough. Because if you go swim in California, the water is not warm, all right? The water is cold. All right, maybe here in the summer is not that bad, but in Central California, it's pretty cold, all right? And that's only a, a couple hundred miles away, all right? The water here is cold, but the water over there is warm. It's warm because of this. What does the warm water do? It evaporates, puts all the mist in the air, the humidity. So we've answered the question, right? Why is it so humid? Because their oceans are warm, right? Why is their ocean warm? Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is pumping in warm water from the tropics, right? What are you following along with that one? All right, warm water coming from the tropics is making it humid over there. Right? The cool thing is, now that the water is warm up here, we can have warm water animals up there. All right? 
is this area right here tropical? No, it's at the same latitude as California. And California is not tropical, but they have warm water, so they can have tropical fish regardless in the ocean, right? Isn't that crazy, right? They can have tropical fish there because even though they're not tropical, the water is still warm, all right? The water is still warm over there even though it's not tropical. Why is it warm? It's coming from the tropics, right? Okay, we got that. Any questions so far on this? All right, let's, let's look at a similar case. We just, we're just gonna talk about it, right? It's going to talk about a similar case that's happening on the west coast, right, where we're at. Over here, the California current, can someone out there explain to me why our water is so cold? Explain to me. Why is our water so cold? Use the same logic that we just applied on the east coast. Mark? The California current carries cold water What do you guys think? Does that sound logical? Yeah. Do you have something to add? Mm -hmm. the water. Yeah, the water comes from the cold. Look where the water is coming from, Alaska. Pretty cold, right? Hopefully it's cold. If you don't think it's cold, well, I don't know. Um, but that's some cold water, and the California current is bringing that cold water down here. So even though we're at the same latitude as over here, the Carolinas, they're experiencing warm water while we experience cold water. And the cold water is a lot drier, doesn't evaporate as much. So it's not quite as humid over here, and our oceans are a lot colder as well. Okay? But we're not polar in climate. We just have cold water because the water is coming from the polar region. Okay? So what kind of fish do we have? We have cold water fish. Right? And over there, even though they're at the same latitude, they have warm water fish. Right? So the currents actually influence the type of ecosystem and the type of organisms that can live in those ecosystems because it brings in warm water and cold water and stuff like that. Right? You can apply that knowledge everywhere else on Earth. Right? So for example, which place, South America or Asia, is going to have similar ecosystems to us? similar ecosystems? South America. It's going to be South America. Why do you think that? Because where's the water coming from? Oh. It's coming from somewhere cold. Do you see that? Right, the water is coming from somewhere cold up here. I think this is called the Peru current. And it's bringing in cold water. So this place is also cold water just like you. Right? But look over here. See this place? What kind of water is going to be over here? The west side of um, the Pacific Ocean is going to be warm water coming from the tropics right over here, mm -hmm. right? So if you guys look up here, Japan, Japan is not tropical. It's at the same latitude as California. Yet if you know Okinawa, it's basically tropical, right? You ever see pictures over there? The water is clear. It's warm, right? They're at the same latitude as we are, yet they're experiencing tropical climate. Warm water from the tropics, right? Yeah. So it's like a figure eight, right? Which is um, is it a figure eight? Sort of. I mean, the water doesn't go this way, though. Mm -hmm. The water does not go from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. It goes straight across right here. So it's just two circles. So I mean, if you're one of those guys who draws your eights like this, then sure. But it's not like this. Okay. Okay. It's like this. Okay, so yeah, you can see that it doesn't even have to be tropical to experience tropical climate, right? I'll give you one more example before we move on. Right over here, Australia has the most famous coral reef in the world. The Great Barrier Reef is not tropical, all right? It's not, this part's tropical, but the Tropic of Capricorn? I don't remember, Cancer, probably, ends here. And this part is not even tropical, yet it's still tropical because the water is same thing with Florida, right? Florida is not tropical, but it looks like it because it's getting warm water. Right. Okay, anyways, enough about that. Hopefully that makes sense, right? 
water coming from different regions can kind of induce tropicality. Right? I made that word up. Okay, it can turn it tropical, kind of. Right? Okay. Anyways, let's continue. Right. So, a quick recap: the trade winds are blowing this way. They're called the easterlies, coming from the east. They end up moving the water. Water hits the continent, and when it starts going up and down, the Coriolis effect takes over and starts making it go left or right. In the northern hemisphere, it goes towards the towards what? Towards the right, and in the southern hemisphere, it goes towards the left. All right. Well, something interesting happens right here where it's going up and down. Notice that since this part's going up and since this part's going down, there's actually a net movement of water going up and down, like this. See that? There's a net movement of water going up and going down. These two masses of water are moving away from each other. They are parting, like the Red Sea, right? They are parting, right? This side is going up, this side is going here. So this place right in the middle, right at the equator, experiences a void, right? But there's not going to be just no water there. You need to fill that in, right? There's not going to be an empty patch of water because it's getting split here and split here. There's no land right there. So how do you refill this area of water? Where do you think it comes from? Anybody have any ideas? Top part of the water is going this way. The bottom part of the water is going this way. So there's nothing here now. So how does it get refilled? The water needs to come back from somewhere. The only place it comes back from, you gotta think 3D. You gotta think 3D. It comes from where? The bottom. The bottom. All right. Let's look at this picture. It's much more apparent. See this right here? Water going left. Water going right. How do you fill the void here? Water coming from the deep fills it up. Does that make sense? Whenever water from the deep comes to the top, it's called upwelling. Haven't we talked about upwelling? We mentioned it for like five seconds yesterday, right? Upwelling is just, you know, a scenario when you take the water from the deep and move it to the top. What is the benefit of upwelling? It brings up the nutrients. You know that there's a lot of nutrients down there because you know how to draw the nutrient profile, right? When we draw the nutrient profile, there's Not that many at the top, but a lot at the bottom, right? So when you take the water from the bottom and move it to the top, you're taking all those nutrients that are down there and moving them to the top. Is that good or bad? That's good. Who likes those nutrients? Plants. Plants like those nutrients. If there's a lot more nutrients, then there's a lot more plants, and there's a lot more, oh yeah, well, what, what do plants do? What was that activity called? PP, primary production, right? Okay, there's a lot more net primary production in areas with more nutrients, okay? So, are we safe to say that the equator has more nutrients now? Where is the nutrients coming from? From the bottom, okay? It's being upwelled to the top because of this net divide of water, all right? So there you go, right here, has more nutrients than the surroundings and more net primary production. Have we explained this now? Does that make sense? Yeah, that area right over here is slightly better than here because of a condition called equatorial upwelling. Upwelling that occurs right along the equator because the water above the equator is going up and the water below the equator is going down. All right, the water is splitting apart, creating that little void in the middle and the only way to fill that void is to take water from the deep and come up, like the picture right over here. Right? Come from the deep and we get equatorial upwelling. Right? That causes that blue line to occur. Right? So that's pretty cool, right? Equatorial upwelling causes that nice little line there. Equatorial upwelling is not the only type of upwelling. You can get upwelling not just at the middle of the ocean, but also actually more prominently at the edges on the coasts, right? So if we go towards the coast, right, like this. What card is that, by the way? 
California current. Hopefully that was pretty obvious. Okay, the California current is right over here. We got this water moving south, vertical movement. If it's moving vertically, it's going to a faster place, right? It's going from slow to fast. Coriolis effect takes over. Which direction does the Coriolis effect push this? Towards the Not the left, because California is in the northern hemisphere. That's North America, by the way. Right, it moves it towards the right, okay? Yeah, like this is North America, right? Canada, Mexico, USA. Okay, towards the right. So it goes towards the right, and do you guys see the net movement of water away from the coast because of this? Water's moving away from the coast, so let me just redraw those arrows like this. Movement of water away from the coast creates a void where? Here or here? Right here. Okay. Again, same logic. How do you fill that void? Water coming from the bottom, just like that. Um, coastal above. See? So when water moves away from the coast, the void over here is filled by water coming from the bottom. All right? I want you guys to draw these diagrams on these worksheets. That's what these things were for. Okay? So it's just a good way to practice, right? And visualize upwelling. Be able to answer why the water comes from the deep to the top because, you know, for all intents and purposes, upwelling is defies gravity. I mean, when in nature would you ever defy gravity, right? Well, you would do that when you move the water away, and then all of a sudden, there's a void there. Does that make sense? Have you got that? You don't have to do it now. And you guys should do it at home and practice. Because this way, if you do it right now, I know you guys are just going to put it away and never look at it. Fail the quiz. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's up to you guys. Do um, you have to label it like uh, wind slope? No, 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 no. Just the arrows is fine. All right. Arrows is good. Okay. All right. Everybody good with this though? All right. So we know how upwelling works. It requires water to move away from an area to create a void, so that the water must come from the deep to fill it back in. If the water comes from the deep, then what is it carrying? Nutrients, right? It's carrying nutrients because if you look at the nutrient profile, where are all the nutrients hiding? They're hiding on the bottom because of gravity, right? Gravity brings the nutrients down, plus there's no plants down here to use the nutrients up, and there's more animals producing the nutrients, at least until here, right? Now there's not that many animals. Okay, so all the nutrients are hiding in the deep, and if you want to access those nutrients, then hope for some upwelling, right? And if you get areas that have a lot of upwelling, those areas tend to be very productive, right? And when I say productive, I mean primary productive, right? Primary production. <clears throat> okay, and then with more plants, obviously more animals as well. Okay, so when I said, we were talking earlier, where are the places on Earth that macroalgae can live? They live in the continental shelf because it's shallow and nutrient rich, right? Why is it nutrient rich there? I gave you one reason before. Because runoff from the land is bringing the nutrients into the water. But now you guys know the second reason why the continent, the, the shelf area, the shallow area is nutrient rich. Coastal upwelling, right? Coastal upwelling occurs on pretty much every single coast brings nutrients up from the bottom. Okay, so the continental shelves in general are just very nutrient rich. You got a lot of life there. I think about 90% of all sea life is just along the continental shelf, which is not that big. It's just, it's like a 20 mile margin along the side of the continents. And 20 miles is not that long, considering the Earth's radius is like Any questions? Everybody good? Okay, let's move on. Okay, 
So, back to this diagram. The ocean is oligotrophic. The macroalgae like to live on the edge where there's coastal upwelling, runoff, carrying all the nutrients. And who likes to live here again? Cyanobacteria. And small things, right? Okay? Small primary producers like to live here because small things have more surface area and you know, they're better at absorbing nutrients. Okay, so let's talk about who can live there, right? The pelagic primary producer. That's what I'm going to call them now. Pelagic means living in the open ocean, all right? So, like, if you ever hear that word pelagic and it's used to describe a fish, then that fish swims around in the open ocean and does not swim around, like, rocks or anything, all right? So you got fish that live on the bottom, bottom fish, demersal fish, right? Fish that live in the middle of the ocean, pelagic fish, right? And these primary producers are floating around in the middle of the ocean, so we call them pelagic, right? Pelagic primary producers. Okay, and we have two types, cyanobacteria and these phytoplankton over here, right? We already know quite a bit about cyanobacteria, right? Cyanobacteria is a type of bacteria that does photosynthesis, right? But we haven't looked at its taxonomy lately. So let's look at this taxonomy. We know that already. Okay. Taxonomy of mm, cyanobacteria. Remember Prochlorococcus? Remember that word? It was this genus. Right? Okay. So it turns out even this cyanobacteria has, you know, taxonomic levels, names, and stuff. And so let's compare these ones to the ones that we visited when we were talking about green algae and stuff, right? Remember we, we saw all those ones shark, the crab, and the green algae, right? We, we saw, I gave you guys these taxonomic levels. Now I want you guys to look through the taxonomic level and tell me which of these four is the odd one out and tell me why. The cyanobacteria. Why is the cyanobacteria the odd one out? What's different about it than the other three? What do the other three have in common that that one doesn't? Uh, yes, but that's, uh, that's too advanced, right? We'll, we'll get there, right? We'll get there in a couple more steps. Um, they're all in the same domain, but this one's in a different domain, right? So at the very least, even though this one's not even an animal, it's in the same domain as these guys, so that means these three are related and this one is not. This one's even in a different domain, right? So I want to take the time right now to define domain because domain, you know, it's, it's pretty important because it's the biggest taxonomic level, right? All of our living organisms can be put under any one of the three domains. There's three, right? Here they are. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya, all right? What's the difference between these? Well, Mara, you were right. Eukarya have a nucleus, right? Um, that's what carrier, eukarya even means. Carrier means nucleus, you means all, or including, right? So clearly the ones on the left are a lot simpler, right? The ones on the left, bacteria, archaea, single cell, tiny little guys, simple little guys, right? Very simple. They don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is just randomly spread throughout their cell. We know a little bit about bacteria. They live all over the place. Right? These little bacteria, they live all over the place. You know, some of them are bad, most of them are good. No, I don't actually. Some of them are bad, some are good, most of them are neutral, right? They don't do anything to you, right? Um, and then, yeah, they just live all over the place, right? They live in literally every single environment. Archaea, on the other hand, are pretty similar to bacteria, but they seem to prefer really extreme environments. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say extreme environment? Like what? What's extreme? Okay, really cold places, really hot places. Yeah, those are extreme environments, right? So I have some examples, right? Inside of rocks where there's no light, no water, no oxygen. Up in clouds when there's less oxygen, really low temperatures, increased radiation, right? Hydrothermal vents. Well, this is something, a marine ecosystem that we're actually gonna talk about later. So hold that 
hot springs are toxic and boiling water and inside glaciers are, have no oxygen and freezing temperatures, right? So we got archaea that live in these extreme environments and then so like people like to call them extremophiles, right? It's just kind of like a, like a common names term, right? Um, but archaea, right? Archaea is the domain. I don't want to get too far into this, but it's good to know, right? What's a bacteria? Single-celled organism that lives all over the place. Archaea, single-celled organism, no nucleus that lives in crazy places. Right? That's basically it. Okay, so let's talk about the more important one, right? Eukarya. Why is this more important? Because we are eukaryotes, right? So we're in eukarya. Everything important is in eukarya, right? Every animal or organism that you probably can think of is in eukarya besides bacteria, of course. That's in its own name. So they're a lot more complicated because most of them are multicellular, right? Most of them. Some of them are single cellular. And they all have a nucleus, right? That's the most important part, right? They all have a nucleus inside their cell that contains the DNA. Okay, so all of our cells, well, no, that's wrong. Most of our cells have a nucleus, right? But it's what a cell does. <clears throat> okay, so eukarya. This is our domain, right? So let's know that. Domain is the highest taxonomic level. What was the second highest taxonomic level? It was called kingdom, right? Kingdom was the second highest taxonomic level, and here I have actually split eukarya into the four kingdoms, right? You guys know the names of these? Maybe this one at least? Animalia. Animalia, yeah. But the other one shouldn't be too hard. This one's called fungi, right? <coughs> Plantae. And the one on the top left, it's called protista, right? We'll talk more about pro protists in a second. Right? But those are like the four basic kingdoms of the domain eukarya. Right? And then we have three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, right? Those two are sim simple, and this one's complex. So when it comes to assigning domains, right? Maybe we'll be able to assign domains to the organisms that we already talked about, right? We talked about a couple primary producers already. Cyanobacteria. Where do you, which domain is cyanobacteria? That one should be pretty obvious. So which one? Bacteria. I mean, it has bacteria in its name. So the cyanobacteria are in domain bacteria. Okay. What was the other one we talked about? Macroalgae, right? Which domain do you think that one is in? Probably eukarya, because, well, for one, how big is it? It's big enough, right? Um, and that's not a single cell, so it can't be either of those two. It's gotta be in here. And which one of these is it? It's a plant, right? So we're gonna put our macroalgae up there. So our last group, the phytoplankton, the one that we haven't talked about yet, Domain, do you think that one's in? Which one? Bacteria, archaea, or eukarya? Any guesses? Archaea, maybe? Because that's the only one that everyone said before? That's a good guess. Right? Alright, so turns out those phytoplankton are in eukarya and they are protists, right? They're in the kingdom protein. So, I think this is a good time to talk about what a protist is, right? So, you've probably heard of a fungus before, an animal, and a plant, right? We all know those, but maybe we don't know what a protist is. A protist is a eukaryote, just like us, but they do all their body function inside of one cell, right? So, it is the group of eukaryotes that are only a single cell, which is crazy because if you think about it, they're eukaryo and you're eukaryo. You take a trillion cells to do all your body functions, but it only takes one cell to do all the body functions, right? So it's hyper efficient, basically, right? And we have a lot of specialized cells. Okay. So the difference is, you know, they're uh, they're just doing all their things inside of one cell, right? So here are some examples. This is an amoeba, right? You guys heard of amoeba before? 
This is a paramecium. And this, this is called a diatom. Okay? You heard that one yesterday, right? Diatom. We'll talk more about those in a second. <clears throat> so single cell protists, right? Or single cell eukaryotes. That's what a protist is. Any questions on protists? Yeah. We, all, we all know what a protist is. The best way to describe it is a eukaryote, something with a nucleus, that has that lives inside of only one cell. Right. So it's tiny, right? It's pretty tiny. Okay, cool. So let's go on to the last part. Single cell eukaryotes. All right, before I get too far, I almost forgot, but during that break, I went out and bought some, some rotophyta. So I might as well just pass this around and make sure you guys don't fall asleep. Okay. All right, so here you go. This is a nori, right? It's a type of red algae. Did you bring rice? Uh, no, sorry, I didn't, I didn't bring the rice, but rice is not a sea animal or a sea creature, so. It doesn't belong in this class. <laughs> Alright you guys, so I'm going to have you guys pass that around as quietly as possible. Um, so yeah. If there's extra, then whoever wants the rest can have it. I don't know the line. There's another one too. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's talk about protestin phytoplankton, right? Keep in mind, this is the third group of primary producers that we have yet to talk about. And since it's a primary producer, it does photosynthesis, right? It fixes carbon. It also appears to be small and microscopic, so it has a lot of surface area. Right? That's what we know so far. The two most common are, here they are, a diatom and a dinoflagellate. Remember yesterday when I told you guys you should know how to draw a diatom? It's pretty easy, it's just a circle. Okay, that's a diatom. So we'll talk about those first. Right, diatoms. Let's draw a diatom. We'll draw a circle, and maybe we just put some random design in here that's symmetric. That's good enough. Okay. It's a diatom. Okay, so diatoms are a type of phytoplankton. And they have a really peculiar shape, right? So first of all, they're circular from the bird's eye view, but from the side view, it looks like a box, okay? So if people say it looks like a jewelry box. Uh, scientists use this word, box and lid frustule, to describe its shape, because when you look at it from the side, it actually looks like, you know, you got the bottom box, and then you got a lid that fits over it. Does that make sense, right? So it's like two cylinders. That's what it looks like, it's in two halves. That's why it's called a diatom. I mean, di means two, right? And atom means piece, right? Unit. So two parts to this diatom. And get this, it's hard. This is, that box and lid frustule is a hard shell. All right, so now that we know it's hard, what do you think it's made out of? Calcium carbonate, right? Very good guess, tricked you guys. It's actually silica. So this is the second type of hard material that things are made out of, right? Most things are indeed made of calcium carbonate, right? But diatoms is made out of silicon dioxide, which is glass or quartz. You guys know quartz, right? Most of your watch faces are made of quartz, right? And um, the word that we use to describe it, anything made out of silicon dioxide, is pronounced silicious, all right? So if something is silicious, <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that uh, that seaweed is pretty delicious, right? Yeah. Now, that would be bad because you, that would hurt your teeth, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, quartz is really hard, right? If you guys don't know, right? quartz is super hard. So yeah, you don't want to bite into anything delicious. Right? But uh, yeah, it describes anything that's made out of silicon dioxide, and we are gonna come up with a small list of delicious organisms. Um, when I say small list, I really mean small. There's only like three. Okay, so pay attention to the future silicious organisms. This is the first one, diatoms. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, C 
see, these guys are microscopic, right? So they basically look like sand particles, if you can see them individually, and they're tiny. If you put a little bit of water in them, it makes kind of like a mud, right? That's what happens when you mix fine grain with water, right? You get like a mud, and we call that mud siliceous ooze, right? It's really interesting because it, it's kind of viscous, like mud or oozes, but when you feel it with your fingers, it feels like exfoliator because these things are all individual and they're all really hard. Right? So it's kind of interesting. If you ever get to examine some delicious foods, all those little diatoms inside the water, you feel it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So looking back at here, I want to point out that there are some colors that we have not seen before. Right? Because we've seen green before, or we've seen red, flacos erythrin, we've seen blue, phycocyanin, but we have other colors like yellow, right? And this brown is not caused by fucoxanthin. These yellows and browns are caused by a new pigment. This new pigment is, can you guys see that? Carotenoids, right? Just look at this name real quick, and the color should be apparent because just think of the vegetable that sounds like it. Which one? Carrots, right? Okay, so carotenoids are kind of like an orange pigment, right? So depending on how many carotenoids are, not that many turn to yellow, high, higher density turn to brown, right? So here we have diatoms, we have some carotenoids inside. We also have some chlorophyll, right? Chlorophyll C, actually. Um, but yeah, diatoms, right? They're little pigments. <coughs> Diatoms are probably the most common phytoplankton. They're just floating around. You can't see them. They're all over the place. The crazy thing is, back in the day, when I was a little kid and I was reading a, this ocean book and it talked about diatoms and stuff, it said that there were like toxic phytoplankton. And I got super scared because I was like, well, what if you just drink the seawater and it has like, toxic phytoplankton in it? Okay. If that were to happen, usually the concentration is not high enough to harm you. But I'll tell you a scenario in which the concentration is high enough to harm you, right? A couple years ago, right? Sorry. A couple years ago, 2015, this crab, right? The biggest crab fishery on the West Coast, at least, not in America. Right? In America, I think the biggest fishery is the blue crab, but Dungeness crab is really popular here on the West Coast and is fished in Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, and Canada, right? Well, they became poisonous one year, right? With this deadly neurotoxin called domoic acid, right? They became poisonous, and all sorts of fishermen were out of a job for almost the whole year, right? Which is bad, because that was their only income. And so, you know, why, did they, why were they poisonous? Why was this crab poisonous? Well, it's because of diatoms. This type of diatom had domoic acid inside of them. All right. So if you ingest some of this diatom, then you'll get poisoned. So how did the crab get the poison inside? Let's think for a second. I'm going to tell you a couple things. The crab does not eat this diatom. So how did this diatom get inside the crab? Any ideas? Probably like from some pollution or or other toxic chemicals that might have gone in into the crab's body, or or maybe somehow something must have happened during its life its life scan. Like maybe yeah, so let me what once it got into the egg or something. Yeah. How does it get in the egg? Yeah, we we want to figure out how does so you you highlighted the fact that there are these things inside the environment, for example, this. Mm -hmm. But how did it get inside of its body? But it doesn't eat the diatom. But it doesn't. It can go into their food. Okay. Let's 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 explore that idea. How about something else eats the diatom, and the crab eats that? Does that make sense? Right. That's what happened. Right. We have filter feeders out there. You don't know what filter feeding is? You don't know? No, it's okay. We we'll, we're going to talk about that a whole lot this whole semester. But filter feeders are organisms that eat plankton, and if you have a filter feeder, for example, a mussel, right? Mussels. Do you guys like eating mussels? Right? Some of you do. Okay, well, it's okay. I don't like mussels either, but I like scallops. 
See, these muscles, they filter feed, they eat plankton. If they ate this plankton, then guess what? This muscle becomes poisonous, right? Well then, when this crab eats this muscle, this crab becomes poisonous, okay? But not just any old poisonous, really poisonous, okay? Because you gotta think, each individual diatom has a little bit of poison inside, all right? This muscle, how many diatoms does it eat? One, just one? How many does it eat? A lot. So it is as poisonous as all those combined. You guys see that? So each individual muscle has the poison of like hundreds of diatoms. Now the crab eats the muscle. How many muscles does it eat? Just one? How many does it eat? It eats a lot. So the crab is not as poisonous as just one muscle. It is as poisonous as all of the hundreds of muscles it ate. Does that make sense, right? Because it ate all those muscles and it got all those toxins. So we get a, uh, like a little, what do you call it? We get a scenario called biomagnification. When you go up the food chain, the things at the top of the food chain are more toxic than the ones at the bottom, all right? This is true for every toxin, not just the moic acid, right? So for example, mercury is probably the thing that most people who eat fish are worried about. Which fish has the most mercury? Big tuna and stuff, right? Why is that one? Just because its body is big and can hold a lot? No, right? For in contrast, there's a lot of big body things that do not have a lot of mercury inside, right? But tuna do because it is so high up on the food chain, right? Okay, it ate a lot of smaller things, and those smaller things ate a lot of other smaller things, and they, which ate a lot of, which got a lot of mercury inside their bodies, right? So. Things at the top end of the food chain is usually going to be a little bit more poisonous, right? Because of biomagnification. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Okay, so anyways, you know, some of the side effects, if you get a really serious case, short-term memory loss, right? Death, I mean, it, it could get pretty crazy, right? The fishery was closed for almost the whole year because they didn't want to take any risks. So what happens to the crabs if they have a um, some animals are immune to this, okay? So the crab is probably fine, yeah. But a lot of animals are not immune to it. For example, mammals like with us, like we would experience health problems from eating this poison. And so during that year, there were a lot of sea otters and sea lions that looked really confused and crazy because they had eaten this toxin and they probably died later. So yeah, what happens to these animals? Probably nothing. Some of them are immune to it, but other ones are affected by it, right? And then, so for example, the sea otters, right? And then they all ate these crabs, and then they they got brain damage from it, right? And then they died. <clears throat> yeah, Tiffany. Um, so why are monkeys so sensitive to the toxins? Like, what is it about them that they so Oh, okay. So. Did you say why are they or why aren't they not? Why are they, I mean, because like you just said. Yeah, okay, so why are they not usually toxic, right? Because, like I said, not all the um, diatoms are poisonous, right? Only some of them are, most of them are not. They're usually safe. It's just that in, in times of warmer weather, the ones that are toxic increases in population in density. So like, there's something called an annual mussel quarantine in which recreational fishermen are not allowed to go out and get mussels in the summer months, just as a precaution, right? It goes from May to October, right? Just as a precaution in case those mussels are poisonous, right? But then during the other months, it should be okay because they don't eat that much of the poisonous one, right? During times of warmer weather, El Nino and stuff uh, increases concentrations of poisonous phytoplankton, right? Okay, so when it's not warm like that, then they're okay. Right? Um, farmed mussels and oysters are usually okay because they control their own water, right? They control what they feed them. They just don't, just don't feed them the poisonous ones, right, in the farms. <clears throat> okay, good. So let's move on and talk about the other one real quick, dinoflagellates. All right, so dinoflagellates is the other type of Protestant phytoplankton, right? And this one does not build a hard shell. Instead, it builds a cell wall 
right, which is made of cellulose, it's the same stuff as plants, right? Um, this information is not critical for the test, I just wanted to show you guys. But I do want to tell you guys that dinoflagellates also have, you know, tendencies for being poisonous, right? There are some dinoflagellates that cause a condition known as red tide. Have you guys heard of this before? Red tide? Look, so it's called a red tide because it looks like the tide is, when it comes in, it's all red because the concentration of dinoflagellates is so high, right? Dinoflagellates have those red pigments inside of them. And if you have enough of them, it looks like the water becomes red, right? Well, those are usually bad, right? And they have some sort of toxin in them. So they tell you not to go swimming because if you drink too much of the water with it, you might get poisoned, right? And same with the shellfish. If you eat the mussels that have eaten, you know, the red tide, then you might get, you know, paralytic shellfish poison, right? Which is some other bad condition, right? It's another thing that you need to avoid during the summer, right? Okay, so red tide in general is bad. Don't go swimming. Don't eat the shellfish when there's a red tide, right? Don't eat the organisms that eat the mussels either because same problem, right? Found that Okay. Dinoflagellates, like they have like two types of toxins, right? This is one of them that occurs around here, the red tide. But there's a really specific one that every Hawaiian knows about in the tropics, right? It has to do a lot with this fish. Anybody know what this is? A barracuda. Yeah, this is the great barracuda. It's a tropical predatory fish. And, you know, um, some people like to eat them, but most people avoid them because they could be poisonous, right? They, you could contract ciguatera, and in short, people just say sig, right? It's like, I just ate some barracuda, and now I'm broken up in hives. And so I said, oh, you probably got the sig, right? So ciguatera poisoning, right? What's it caused by? Dinoflagellates, poisonous dinoflagellates. But here's the thing, dinoflagellates is a tiny phytoplankton. This big guy here, you think it eats the tiny phytoplankton? No. How did it get into its body again? Eating something that actually did eat the dinoflagellates, right? So in this case, um, there's a lot of reef fish, small reef fish that eat the dinoflagellate, and then this guy eats a lot of the reef fish and becomes a lot more toxic than the reef fish itself, right? So. If you're in a tropical area, you probably do not want to eat a big predator like this. You probably want to eat the smaller ones. Right? The smaller ones are not going to be as toxic as these ones are. All right, but yeah, this is just an example. Singletary is caused by a dinoflagellate like that. Right? Not all dinoflagellates are bad. Right? You guys heard of bioluminescence before? Organisms that light up. Right? They create this so uh, little symbiotic relationship with bacteria and the bacteria produces light, right? It's pretty cool, right? The, the light gets produced and now it can glow, all right? Dinoflagellates is one example of, you know, an organism that can glow, right? I'll give you some other ones like a deep sea angler, maybe you've heard of that one before, or fireflies, right? That's a terrestrial example of something that produces its own light. Well, over here, dinoflagellates in the ocean, for some reason, they can flash if they are disturbed, all right? Uh, it's not completely clear why they do that, but you can go out and observe this yourself, right? So if you ever decide to go swimming in the ocean at night, then turn off your light for a second and wave your hands around. Disturbing the water will cause the dinoflagellates around you to sparkle and it'll look like all these sparkles around you, right? It's pretty crazy. This is everywhere, right? Not just the tropics, all over the place. It's just that tropics get such high densities that this stuff happens on the beach, right? This doesn't happen over here, but you can still see the sparkles if you get up and close, right? In the tropics where the density is high, it is actually like this, right? It's pretty crazy. So for example, if you go to Hawaii, um, Pearl Harbor, that muddy water is full of dinoflagellates. And if you go at night and just like, wave your hands around or walk around in it, it's just, it's just all green around you. It's crazy, right? So like, I used to go crabbing there and I'd walk through the muddy water at night and both my legs would just be completely green, 
right? And then I would see like this green thing, just like, what do you think that was? That was a fish swimming through the water, disturbing the dinoflagellates along the line. Just, you know, like the green flash, right? It's pretty crazy, right? Really interesting. You don't see that over here as much. Right? Is it easier for you to catch them then because you have like the mark on you? Oh, um, like the fish? I wasn't going for the fish. No, for the crabs. Oh, the was it easier? I don't think the crabs care whether there's a flashing light or not. But uh, good question, yeah. I think they just care about what the bait smells like. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, bioluminescence, I just wanted to introduce that diatoms are responsible for a little sparkle that you see in the water at night. If you turn off all the lights, right, you won't see them in the It's because it's really faint. <clears throat> Um, here's another case of good dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates that live inside of coral provide coral with food. Right? That's pretty cool. Coral gets free food from these dinoflagellates, and in return, because the dinoflagellates live inside the coral, the coral provides shelter for the dinoflagellates. Okay? We're going to talk a lot more about this later on in the last lecture, so don't worry too much. Just know that dinoflagellates could form these symbiotic relationships with other organisms, such as coral. Right? In this case, do you guys see how both of them benefit? Right? One of them gets food, the coral. The other one gets shelter, the dinoflagellates. So they both benefit by working together. When two things benefit in a symbiosis like that, we call it a mutualism, right? Because the mutual benefits, right? that's why they stick together. But then again, not all symbioses end in such mutual benefit. Right? Some of them end up in which one of them benefits at the cost of the other. Right? Is, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Exactly. Parasites, right? Parasite is also two organisms working together, but one of them benefits, gets a lot of food and shelter, the other one suffers, right? It loses energy. Health. Okay, so parasitism. Dinoflagellates can also be parasites off of fish. Right. This dinoflagellate is eating this fish alive. Right, causing these sores to happen. This is crazy because when we introduced dinoflagellates in this class, I told you guys it was a primary producer. What do primary producers supposed to do? Photosynthesis. But what is this one doing? He's eating meat, right? So, what does that tell you? Not all dinoflagellates are photosynthesizers, right? They're not all primary producers. Some of them are actually, you know, here's a, here's a word, heterotrophic. I guess I'll hold off until later to explain that, but that basically means it eats other things, right? Not all Dinoflagellates are primary producers. Some of them eat other things, right? <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna finish this real quick and I'll explain. Okay, so just a couple other examples of phytoplankton, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the tropic pyramid real quick and we'll be good to go. Okay, so this is called coccolithophore, right? Coccolithophore is a type of phytoplankton. It's hard. Anybody want to guess what its hard shell is made out of? Ah, see, I tricked you again. Now this one's calcium carbonate. Back to me for it. Okay, they're calcareous. And if you get enough of them, then you get chalk, right? So, for example, over here, the White Coast of Dover, over on the East Coast, is a big mountain of just coccolithophores. Now, that's like unfathomable to me because. If you think about how small a coccolithophore is, how many do you think are inside this mountain? Right. Huge, huge number, right? There must have been some sort of ancient algal bloom that caused all the coccolithophores to grow and then they all died and settled here in this mountain. And it became the white cliffs, right? The cliffs are white because it's made out of chalk. Right. Okay, the other type of, last type of phytoplankton we're gonna cover is called a silicoflagellate and this one should be pretty obvious what it's made out of. This one is silicious, right? 
Okay, so we got two silicious things now, diatoms, silicoflagellates, and we have a new calcareous organism, a couple other folks. Right. <clears throat> okay, all right, so sorry if I'm going a little fast, I just wanna finish this. Um, you guys can check this out at home too, by the way. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is the trophic pyramid, so, Almost finished here. Um, all in all, the three different primary producers, since the whole ocean, the open ocean, is oligotrophic, that's all cyanobacteria, right? So cyanobacteria contribute 90% of all the net primary production that we see in the ocean. So that 46% of global net primary production, 90% of that is cyanobacteria. Because the open ocean is just all oligotrophic and all cyanobacteria. So therefore, the other 10% is split amongst the other two. 5% go towards the protease in phytoplankton. And the other 5%, who's that? It's gotta be the macroalgae, right? The macroalgae, the seaweeds, take up the other 5% of the net primary production of Earth, right? Or sorry, not of Earth, the oceans, the marine ecosystems. Okay, so most of it's cyanobacteria, parts of it, Here's the thing, like I said, all these guys are primary producers. They do photosynthesis. So where do they fit on the trophic pyramid? Down here. This is the trophic pyramid, right? A trophic pyramid is this pyramid-shaped thing that has to do with eating, right? Trophic means eating, okay? So what's going on here? Things higher up in the food chain are gonna be up there, low in the food chain are gonna be down here, all right? But this is more descriptive than a food chain because it has these blocks, right? These blocks indicate something called biomass, right? How much of there is, there is in a certain area, all right? So if you wanna figure out the biomass of the producers, you just take all the producers, weigh them, and now you have the combined weight, that's the biomass. You can say biomass of anything. Biomass of students in this classroom. Take all you guys, get the combined weight, that's your biomass, right? Biomass of humans on Earth, take the weight of all the seven billion people, weigh them all, combine it, that's the biomass, right? So the biomass of the producers, all combined, weigh more than the biomass of all the other levels, right? The lower levels have more biomass, the higher levels have less biomass. And we'll talk more about that later introduce it today. If you are in these levels, then you eat the level below you. If you eat the level below you, by definition, all four of these levels are consumers. You can't have a producer up here. Does that make sense? You can't, because by definition of being above something else, you eat them. If you eat them, then you're not a producer, you're a consumer, right? So. We got four levels of consumers, or more, or less, and one level of producer. Everything near the bottom, producers and low consumers, have greater biomass, and the high consumers have low biomass, all right? So, in case you're confused, like, the fact that there's like sharks and killer whales and big things up there, and you're like, well, those are big, how do they have low biomass? How many killer whales are there in nature? Very few. Combine the couple thousand killer whales you have, weigh them, they will not weigh as much as all the cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria combined, there's tons and tons and tons of those. All right. Okay, so how do we distinguish this consumer from this consumer, from this one, from that one? Just assign some really, really easy, um, you know, agit uh, modifiers, right? primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. By the time you get to the very top and it has no more above that, you could just straight up call it apex, right? You can call it apex, for the apex for tip. But as for these guys, primary, secondary, tertiary. So if you guys wanna follow the same logic here, which one of these words would you assign to producer? about it. 
First level consumer is called primary consumer. Second is called secondary, tertiary. There's only one level of producer. Which one should it be? What was that? Primary. Do we know where that word comes from now? Primary producer? Now we have it. It's, they're called primary producers because this is the first and only level of producers there are. Right? So it's automatically, by default, primary. Right? Primary producers, primary consumers, secondary producers. Right? So next time you hear the word primary producer, hopefully it's not confusing anymore. Right? In the beginning, maybe you've never heard that word before, but now we know where it comes from. Primary producers. It's the only level. The first level of consumers is called primary consumers. Right? These guys, these are the plants that we've been talking about. Right? Therefore, these guys that eat these guys, what kind of organisms are these? What are they? Muscles. It could be muscles, yeah. But the point is, a muscle is a type of animal, right? Animals, all these guys are animals, okay? So this wraps up our lecture on primary producers, right? We're done with that section. From here on out, we will move up the trophic pyramid and start talking about animals tomorrow, okay? All right, so thanks for staying a couple minutes after. Um, make sure you guys finish that homework assignment. It's gonna be due probably tomorrow night. Now that I finished the lecture, it is, the whole thing is definitely due tomorrow. Um, I'm pretty certain that the quiz is only up until this worksheet, all right? And it's going to be next Tuesday, all right? Tomorrow we're going to have just different lectures and stuff, all right? Okay, see you guys tomorrow. Oh, okay. You guys have any questions?